I'd like to uh, read something. So I call this perfect silence complete. In the empty wide space of soons, hate sent me on a journey to find the love which allowed my tears to fall to the floor so that ignorance could step on them as the devil tried to lure. But the voices of envy guided me through the ripples of experience where redemption awaits in a secret alley behind a speakeasy's door hidden from the delusional mirror that reflects yesterday's screams of comfort. The symmetry of my pain is a perfect angle that keeps my hope gasping for air trapped in a field of endless repetition, yet time heals everything. We are an echo coming back into the one truth of a perfectly chaotic pebble thrown into the reflection we cast upon a still body of water. In this breath, I hear every voice till this point as I shed the fear you project onto me. I have been knocked down so much, I can't stop looking up in gratitude for all I am. In this skin, I hold the secrets of my eyes, and they have seen all but one thing, love. Through my hands, I have felt the pain of others, but in my voice is the wisdom of every soul experienced in my harvest. The art of survival is a canvas slathered in pride and prejudice. With every bipedal motion, there's a moment in life when the subconscious catches up with the self-conscious mind that constrains thoughts into a realization, as opposed to a general ideation that pleases us into a submissive coma of social conformity, which eases others' minds into believing that everything is okay. What we don't see is, is that the suffering is a trifecta of creativity that creates a bond with the brain to the pen onto the paper, thus bringing forth the song of the soul. What makes us men? What makes us women? And what makes us human? All these things we have. Yet we never see the infinite dynamic of a single floating cloud into the vast blue. If we die a hero and alone, but feel happiness, then and only then is it at that very instant we fall into the center of the chaotic pebble. One truth echoes. I, I don't do it for, I do it for, for everybody, I guess. I can be somebody else on the wall. You know, it's not about the money, it's more of a movement. I think the art is gonna grow, like, the graffiti is gonna just... I kinda want little kids and old people to be able to say, that's it, JC. There's definitely days that I'm not doing this because I want to, I think it's because I, some, some days I have to. I mean, like, you see it, and then you see it, like, like you didn't, I didn't realize how clear you can see it from the street, you know, from, like, 15 feet away, you know? Graffiti, or from the Greek graphien, or which means to write on the walls, or from the Italian graffito, which is actually the uh, plural, um, that's the earliest uh, naming of graffiti. Street art is what I would say, not graffiti. Um, I got introduced to graffiti back in the late 80s or early 90s, but it wasn't graffiti. Graffiti, back then, graffiti was part of hip-hop. So it was not its own separate entity. It just, you just kind of did it as part of the culture. So I got my first taste of hip-hop when I came to Philadelphia. Uh, back in 85, they used to break dance the clothespin. I used to vandalize, because it wasn't, we didn't consider it graffiti, it was really vandalism. 
So in the 90s, I was running around putting my name everywhere, 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 everywhere. And then <clears throat> one day I was walking down the street on 52nd Street and I had this hat backwards and it had my little tag going across the back of it. And some, some dude was like, hey, hey, hey man, what, what does that say on your hat? I turned around and I was like, it says JC. And the guy was like, Hey man, I, I've seen that a couple of places. And I was like, uh, you know. And he was like, come here, let me talk to me. And I said, all right. When I, when I started doing it, the city of Philadelphia was completely graffiti. Like you'd go into a subway train and there are lighter tags on the ceiling. I broke off from it in the late 90s when I opened my first airbrush shop up on 69th Street. And I, I found out I liked money. And that's when I started doing airbrush, because, you know, it's, you're doing graffiti letters on a denim jacket, getting paid for it at this point. So he said, I'm going to introduce you to a couple people. I said, all right. He said, this is right here. This is this is Disco Duck. I said, what? 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 <laughs> he said, this right here, this is, uh, this is Pan, a.k.a. JK. And I'm like, what? You know, and then he's like, this is Raz. And, I'm, and this is Ra Ra, and this is SN, and this is So Bad, and this is Cruise. And I was just like, it was amazing. Just all in one moment, I met like most of the greats here in Philly. The mindset back then was I'm, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm never going to be in a gallery. I'm never going to be seen. So I'm going to do my own marketing. And since, uh, you know, McDonald's and all these companies have been doing billboards for years, it was kind of the poor man's version of billboards. And then the daredevils came. You used to walk down a city and you'd see someone hit a building seven stories up. And the great thing back then was you didn't know who hit it. You had no clue until they let you know. That was it. I started kind of hanging with those guys and, you know, they make you hungry for rep and all that stuff. And so then I wanted to write my name more and more and more and more. Like I said, my, my experience with graffiti back then was very brief, but apparently uh, if you talk to a lot of the older Philadelphia graffiti artists, they'll, they, they mention me quite a bit. And that's kind of, that's, that's funny but it wasn't because back then we weren't oh I'm not a you know I'm a graffiti no you never said you were a graffiti artist girls didn't like it when you were a graffiti artist they used to be like oh my god you write on buildings oh. um it was just about hanging out with the guys and getting drunk and getting high and, and hitting stuff and then me I kind of grew up my girlfriend got pregnant and I realized I had to take care of my kid and but then they got like crazy they started arresting people for graffiti and stuff and I said no I'm, I'm a little too grown for this I'm gonna leave this alone I left it alone for a long time years and years and years I don't go out and hit things more I, I got I have way too much to lose and I've had way too much to lose and I'm, I'm a greedy fuck so I would much rather airbrush this on a shirt and get paid for it The question about whether there's a subculture of graffiti is an interesting one for an anthropologist. Um, so that begs the question, what is a subculture? Well, first of all, what is a culture? A culture is a shared set of values, beliefs, practices, ideas, and products amongst a group of people. These people don't have to live with one another. They don't have to know each other, um, but they share those things in common. So a subculture is, within the context of this larger set of values and practices and beliefs, a competing set of ideals, set of expressions. It's a different shared set of symbols or a variation on those symbols. You might ask why a subculture forms. So a subculture generally forms because there is some reason why the group can't fit into the values that are held by the majority of the culture, or that they are divergent enough that they feel as though they have to form a group separate from, though coexistent in that culture, so that they can support each other in those different values and practices. So we all come from broken homes in, in one way or another, and uh, my family had a lot of money and I decided to walk away from that life, or maybe I got kicked out of that life. I don't know, it's too late in the game to know. I did a lot of drugs, I was getting high, fucked up, and um, in Philly, everywhere, moving around, and, um, <clears throat> and I, I, in 2.18.06, I heard a voice, 
and uh and I was like homeless in my car and I <laughs> I was pissing in a bottle and it was bad. I, I was DJing around the country at the time. I had a record store down south and I was left on top of my records. I had to give up my favorite dog, which was a spiritual bond for me. And I heard a voice. It was a really cold winter and, and it said very softly, it said, have you heard enough? And immediately I just said, yes. But I was saying, I was looking on Google and I didn't see nothing of mine. And I was just like, feeling some sort of way. And I was feeling some sort of way. And then I just left it alone. And then my friend killed herself and I started uh, painting her name. Excuse me. Yeah. Painting her name. Over and over and over. I first saw graffiti um, on uh, on freight trains. My uh, my dad had a a wood shop in an industrial park in uh, in New Jersey, and. Um, and um, I uh, like freight trains would pull into the industrial park, and um, and I saw that it was like I saw that there's you know there's obviously something written on these freight trains that was not it wasn't put there it was it was obviously illegal and it looked bold and and like brash and I loved it. I start painting when I was like about 10, 11 year old and this passion of graffiti and like the, all the movement of hip hop that was really big in my hometown where I grew up in Colombia. Um, all this movement kind of like get me like really passionate. So I started looking more into it and like researching and I came out like uh, New York was the, the ones that start graffiti with Tacky 183 and other graffiti artists, graffiti writers from New York. I started researching more about graffiti and I found out that Philly was the first that do, started doing the graffiti. And from that day on, it just changed for me. The dynamic changed and I am very big into the Dalai Lama and the never give up. I read a lot of Emerson. I read a lot of, um, I think it's Krishna Maruti. Anything that's transcendental or spiritual or that takes me with out of my life and, and I can see the world for what it is and I think that revolt we all have it and mine is definitely love because it's something that I haven't experienced to its fullest capability or to what I need it to be so where I used to do graffiti pieces when I was a kid I find myself being more of an artist and I believe in human will and 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 I guess uh, mindful meditation where every day as we walk it's that daydreaming and, and knowing that no matter what you think, you can do it, and there is no boundaries. There is only popular opinion. That's it. There is no yes or no. One day I was just painting it, and I seen some dudes go up on these train tracks. And they fucking did the whole side of this fucking train. I said, damn, I should be doing that. And I went up, and I painted her name on a train. And then I painted my name on a train. And then I painted my name on another train. And then another train. And then another train. And I wanted to do it. And I immediately, like, I ran back to my dad's shop. And I grabbed a can of uh, white Rust-Oleum and started scribbling my name on these freight trains. And, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty young. And, um, you know, I, and it was like, it was, you know, years later I started taking it more seriously. That's kind of where it started for me. When it started in the, today, you know, she killed herself, I want to say, five years ago. So that's when I started really painting, really painting again. I was bored, sick of fucking music. I do music, I'm sick of music. So I was like, uh, let me just paint, and paint and paint and paint and paint. You know, people do it for rap, they do it for whatever. I just paint. I don't, I just paint. I started getting more involved in the graffiti world in Colombia and everything. And I said like, I, I felt stuck for some reason. And like, there wasn't like too many opportunities or outlets to do that. So I kind of decided to jump to another opportunity. and. I got like a couple opportunities that took me to come here. And uh, there's definitely days that I'm not doing this because I want to. I think it's because I, some, some days I have to. Someone can do graffiti and be part of those shared practices and share the set of values, beliefs, ideas that come out of a feeling of disenfranchisement or a feeling of not being accepted 
into their communities. And someone can do graffiti just as an act and not have that shared set of practices. And I think that those two different kinds of expressions are different because they don't, they come from the subculture or they don't come from the subculture. I think the fact that people who are part of a subculture are very self-aware is evidence of that expression. Because when you're in a group that is um, judged as being divergent or digressive of your larger hegemonic society, right, the rules in society, you are very aware of those evaluations, those negative evaluations of yourself. So when we hear people of that subculture speaking, what we tend to hear are a, a realization of those judgments and valuations that we hear and their, and their self-awareness of their expression being a comment on those evaluations. And I think when we see that in graffiti, what we're seeing is an expression of that subculture. And when we see someone just doing it because, you know, they're putting it in a gallery or because they think it looks pretty or stylized, and we don't see those comments on larger culture, then we can assume that that is not coming out of a subculture of graffiti, that shared set of values. We're talking social economics because you have different forms of writers now. You have the graffiti artists that grew up in the hood, grew up around graffiti, grew up around writers, writers and their families. And then you have the kids in the suburb who skate, and it's a fad for them. You go to Northern Liberties or Fishtown, like, I remember when, you know, I, I got out of prison and I went to, <laughs> I went to Fishtown where under the L people are shooting dope. Now there's like, I mean, I hate to say it, there's just like white kids down there at like 3 a.m. with like $400 drunk sitting on a wall and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? But everybody's an artist, everybody's doing this, everybody's doing that. The fact that we see the graffiti move into the suburbs as part of hip hop culture and pop culture doesn't mean that those gestures of graffiti coming from the suburbs come from that same place of oppression. They're more of a mimicking of the things that they aspire to from those pop culture icons. But the act of graffiti in its essence is really about that emotive quality that comes from performing the action. The graffiti is like different branches. You know, there are people that just focus on tagging and bombing that is just going out the streets and like tag and just put whatever out there, you know, it doesn't need to be something beautiful or aesthetic for the eye. But in my opinion or my own like goals for my career or whatever, it's like I, I'm always trying to achieve a level of like aesthetic, you know what I mean? Like to kind of be gentle to the eye or like can call the attention, you know? So, so it's interesting, and even that's kind of divided. Now you have taggers or vandals who aren't, that's all they're considered. They, they don't care about their hands, they don't care about anything, they just, care, they just love destroying shit with a marker or paint. And then you have your graffiti artist now that's kind of separated where it's become its own art form. And there's these, this complex set of rules of what you can and cannot write on, you know, no schools, no churches. Uh, no private property like mom and pop uh, houses unless it's like a wall on the side if there's like a corner property um, which is really actually quite interesting that it's developed organically on its own you gotta do all of it in order to be a good artist you know you cannot just do one little thing you gotta learn everything and then put it together in your own way The earliest examples that we know of of writing on walls would be from the prehistoric periods in now the earliest ones seem to be in Indonesia 40,000 years ago. But maybe one interesting thing in terms of graffiti would be the tagging that they do. We could consider it with their hands. So they would put their hands up on a wall. They would throw ochre paint or other kinds of pigments around it. But it seems as that might have been an indication of saying we're here. Um, and the hands represent the people that lived in that cave. Philadelphia is a city of what's called hand styles. So it's about how good your tag is um, or your hand. And there's two different theories. One is your hand style, how good it is. And the other one is, the theory is it doesn't matter as long as you get all over the place. The act of doing the art, of actually placing it on the wall, 
is an act of empowerment, whether it was from Roman times or whether it's illustrative of the oppression of modern day, uh, in particular that of the 1960s, where we see in Philadelphia, um, you know, during the Civil Rights Movement and the Rizzo administration, a lot of unrest in the 1960s. So the act of, of, it wasn't just the final product, it was the act of actually doing this subversion, this right illegally vandalizing writing on a wall, and at the same time stating that they exist and that their existence is creative and meaningful. I think my style is like, a lot of it's like pretty traditional, you know what I mean? And I, uh, I take little certain things from, from other people, old people, new people, and I put my own twist on it, you know, I make it mine. And, um, you know, and according to what I think looks good. I do more stencil work now, but they're all interactive, and it's, it's all having to do with educating and trying to get people to realize, but you need a heart rate and you need culture and you need to, you need to be open-minded at that point, I think. So I like people to see it and I like to frequent the, the rail yards a lot. There's something about that atmosphere. You know, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not in control of the atmosphere, you know what I mean? You're kind of like, it's totally in the moment. Well, they, they travel, one, and they don't buff them like they do walls. You know, you can run around, you can put your name on all these damn walls, and maybe they're five minutes later, it's gone, especially today. I don't even know why cats run around. I, can, I don't want to waste the paint. I can see some shit I did five years ago, ride on by, and it's probably whack. But, <laughs> you know, it's still going. I'm happy. I just go do another one. I like to obviously put things where people are going to see it, almost like advertising. I kind of want little kids and old people to be able to say, that's it, JC. You know what I mean? Not, what was that? It was fly, but I couldn't tell what it was, you know. I have a, a character, like an angry little pine tree, that's, maybe that stands out a little more against tags, you know what I mean? Maybe that stands out more to the average person. But I want to push people to, to where it's like, know this word and understand that it's been there since the beginning of time you know we've we've been told to you know one time one moment we were you know naked walking around having sex with everything and someone said hey put these pants on hey speak this way hey do this do that and then here we are fancy animals again and i need to i feel like that word belongs on everything keystone crossbones belongs on everything you know and i want people it's like I want them to, it's more of a movement, an organic movement. But it's, it's a need to be seen. It's, a, it's, it's almost like, okay, the easiest way to explain it nowadays is in dog terminology. So dogs go out and they see a telephone pole and they piss on it. And then another dog comes and he sniffs that telephone pole and he goes, ah, Dookie's been here. Uh, I've been here too. Another dog comes and goes, oh, Dookie and Bob have been here. And that's kind of what graffiti is. It's like, oh, shit, Crown's here. Someone goes, oh, look, crown of mutt. And then you go back to see if it's still, how long it remains. Okay, the buff hasn't hit it yet. It's been a month. Oh, my tag's still there from a month. Oh, shit. Any famous writers that came from Philadelphia? Yeah, there's several. Okay, Espo is from Philly. Nosego used to be a writer, now he's actually a quite successful uh, artist. Cornbread invented graffiti pretty much. He's in Wikipedia and, and uh, about to be in the Smithsonian for being the, uh, the godfather of it. Raz was very famous. He's the reason they have block letters in Philly. Uh, Chewy, Lewis, um, TT, all the original guys that came along with cornbread. But there's, there's, there's a growing, there's quite a few and there's a growing number from Philly and New York. Because if you wanna, you know, include New York, then you've got Dr. Revolt, you've got Class, and a lot of the guys from New York were Philly, New York, Philly, New York. Dan One, another famous guy uh, from New York, moved to Philly. Risk. Another guy from uh, New York moved to Philly. Um, so it's really interesting. Philly and New York kind of have kind of connection with us jumping between, you know, especially back in the day, between the two. We don't have any Basquiat's or any like Keith, Keith Herring's. Let's remember that Keith Herring was a trained artist. He wasn't a street kid. He wasn't in a gang. He wasn't from a disenfranchised neighborhood. 
he was an artist who basically took on, he took on the style of graffiti in his work. And his expressions were consistent with graffiti in the, in the sense that he was talking about something which was the result of oppression. The lack of people um, to acknowledge that AIDS was a problem. The lack of the ability of our culture to do something about it. Keith Haring was a street artist doing his little characters all over the street. I have a, there's an artist, uh, Manny, in Philadelphia. He used to do it right along with him. He was friends with him. I think the same thing can be said of Basquiat. I mean, Basquiat was, was part of that underground arts culture with Andy Warhol. And um, in that sense, he was already someone who, had, who was part of the in-group um, when they brought him in to be representative of sort of what graffiti looks like when it goes mainstream. Like, if you ever explore a nose-go piece, they're beautiful. They're unbelievable. And he was a graffiti artist. Now, I don't know, think, like Espo, he doesn't consider himself a graffiti artist anymore, or a street artist anymore. He's a fine artist. But his roots were there. Um, you know, when he was doing this goofy character on, on those concrete divides in the highway. Um, when he was tagging his name before that. So, uh, it, you know, everything progresses. Um, hopefully American culture will progress because in Europe, just to let you know, it's already a fine art style. Like most of the, the old head writers in America make their money from Europeaners buying it. The French appreciate it, the Germans appreciate it, all of Europe appreciates this art form. And they realize that we created it and they idolize the people who are old school in it. Um, and they're worth money. It's only in America where we have this fucked up mindset of, well, art is only what this small group of conservatives think it is, or these liberals that turn conservative, because that's really what it is. Certainly the art, the wall art that has been drawn into the museums and galleries by definition because of its context is art. So, you know, in anthropology, we make a distinction between what's art and what is not based on its symbolic meaning. So if principally its purpose is to be viewed, it is not, doesn't have a use, but it doesn't have a, a quotidian use, but its principal purpose is to be looked at for its meaning, then we would consider it, consider it art. But if it has a purpose that's more pedestrian, like for example, I'm here, or a message that might be given to somebody else on the street, then technically we might not consider it art because it has a pragmatic use, first of all. So that would be my answer as an anthropologist. Um, I think you might get a different answer from the guys on the street who consider anything they produce to be art, have artistic value. They're not just writing their name. They're writing it in a way that's stylized. And, you know, that's repetitive. And that in itself makes it ritualized and symbolic. So in that sense... All of the art, you know, all of it is art. All of the graffiti is, that we find is art. From the society's perspective, obviously, if it's subversive and considered illegal, we would define it as vandalism. But that doesn't mean it's not art. It's just art that's vandalism, that's illegal. Now, there's, there's different parts of, of graffiti. There's throwies, bombs, and piecers. If you go down someplace and you see, like, it looks almost like a mural, and it's beautiful. It's called a piece work. It means the guy spent some time on it, had it in his black book. Um, that's abstract topography. That's modern art. That is the next step of, of modern art's urban art. And anybody who's got half a head should be able to look at this and say, wow, this is art. As a graffiti artist, you're trying to reach a higher level, if you get comfortable with what you're doing, you, you get stuck. So that's why I always feel like I'm, I'm in the middle level because I think that I'm never gonna learn the full potential of what I can be able to do with the graffiti. You know, it's like a beautiful tool and a beautiful medium of expression. So I think there's so much to learn that it's always like, you know, step by step, it's like the life. There's a science to that. There's an art form to that. I can pull a tape line 15 feet straight with just one hand and tap it into place. I really like love the, the Philly hand style, you know? Like the big elongated letters, tall hands, uh, what we call wickeds, you know? Um, you're not gonna see that anywhere else. And, and the, 
I think the interesting thing about it is that, like, not only does it take a trained eye to read, but, like, it takes practice to be able to write it. But it's absolutely modern art. People are paying good money for it. Like I said, Pose 2 got $17,000 for taking a New York City subway sign and tagging shit on it, Pose 2 on it, and then selling it. Um, I couldn't believe it went for that much. Uh, uh, they auctioned quite a few pieces off. I can't believe a Banksy gets, you know, half a million dollars. Um, but they do. So it's already entered the art field. And now it's just, we need to climb out of that, that old mindset and embrace the new. And so when we reframe street art or as desirable because it's on a mural or we look at it in a museum, what we're saying now is the people who create that are the desirable variety of the people who do that wall art. Okay, so the mural arts began out uh, as part of the anti-graffiti network. And they discovered that if they gave the graffiti artist and uh, a wall and said, do a mural, um, that that wall didn't get graffitied again. So they started hiring uh, graffiti artists to design murals and then started using them when they got other designers to, to paint the murals. And now they really do nothing with the graffiti artist, or if they do, they're street artists from 10,000 miles away. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Maybe that's why we see this, how we can try to understand this difference between wall art and graffiti is the people that make wall art are the people that are legitimate and the people that do graffiti are not and i just think they've they've gone they've strayed too far from their path and then all of the murals they have are passe it's the same five illustrators designed the same five uh of, of murals of everybody in the community with a basket going like They've gotten some good, they're getting out of that now, don't, you know, I've seen some stuff they're doing, but whenever they do anything graffiti in Philly, they don't use anybody from Philly, not even people who used to be from Philly, like Espo, um, who are now famous, like they just don't, they don't do any of that. So I have a big grievance with that and things are starting possibly to change. Uh, things will definitely change when the old guard leaves, because you can understand City Hall, most of the cities in America, their city council are like in their 70s and 80s. Uh, so they're anti-graffiti, anti-weed, anti-this, anti-that. Um, and when they start leaving and the younger generation starts coming in, uh, my generation's more accepting of it. That I can tell. No. No, I'll just say no. <laughs> You're not even looking. I am. You live on the edge. No, I can't. The, the lights are like kind of blowing all the cars out. I can't tell what they are. <laughs> all right. Go up this time. If this happened in the suburbs and there were nice pictures on the walls that kids were painting, it would have been framed in a very different way. So the fact that it's considered an urban problem, graffiti, has everything to do with who's doing it. It's not just that what they're seeing is unattractive or it's vandalism on somebody's building that doesn't want, want it there. And I think that's significant because now when we see public mural art funded so strongly in Philadelphia, everyone thinks that's beautiful. But the point is, they don't like this art mostly because who's doing it. And so it's framed as an urban problem because of who is doing it, not because of what's put up on a wall necessarily. And this is just from my observation and talking to my customers and what have you, and my friends. Poorer neighborhoods, it has a very big significance. And usually, uh, because it, most of the neighborhoods are so economically depressed to begin with, that they're ugly. So the graffiti actually beautifies them, even if it's just hands. Uh, so I think it has a great significance and the people who are doing it. So in poor neighborhoods, there's violence. There's not necessarily violence with graffiti. Now, Fox News tried to, to because of course, you know, God forbid they actually do research on something they report on, did a report last year in Philly or the year before, trying to link 
the crown that's on certain graffiti pieces or tags with that of Latin kings. And it's, it's not. The crown on top just means that some asshole saying that he's king and you're not supposed to do that. Other people put the crown on for you. A lot of the writers, if they're not from the suburbs, they're from poor communities. And you have a lot of overdoses, you have a lot of gang violence, uh, not gang violence, because it's not gang violence, because they're not really real gangsters. Um, a lot of drug violence, we'll say that. Uh, and a lot of young guys getting killed. And so what happens is, uh, the, the, you know, every, a lot of people in the community write, so they'll get together and they do an in memory of peace. So they, they either throw up words like, you know, long live whatever, or in, the, in loving memory, or whatever, a pookie, boo boo, whoever. And then you got some where they actually do the face and then do it. And, it, and for them, it's a, it's a healing aspect, it's a respect aspect of the person who's fallen, and it's another expression of, the graf of, of, of graffiti. And especially when a writer goes down, you'll get a lot of pieces where the writer, the dead writer's name will be thrown up right along with his buddy who does it. And he'll say, you know, see when I get there, such and such, or he'll long live what, what, you know, whoever has passed. Now the one benefit that I can put with graffiti is that it helps, uh, it helps the drug addicted stay clean. Because when they get an urge to use, especially uh, a heroin addict or really any addict, you go out and you do a route, and it, it takes care of that need to shoot up. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, and it also helps vets with post-traumatic stress syndrome. So when, when the vets that I know that write, well, they start either uh, going through anxiety attacks because of what happened uh, in a wartime situation or a uh, police time situation, uh, they'll take marker or paint, and they go on a route, and they get that same rush because it's illegal. And it helps them deal with that, and it helps them, helps to keep them from blowing their brains out. I get like from 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 being totally in the moment and being totally focused on what I'm doing. All of the all of the, the bullshit, everything from you know like, you know, from my day, from like if I had a shitty week or anything, all that just goes away. Totally focused on what I'm doing, and you know, totally satisfied with the end result. You know, does it have significance for the city? It keeps the buff employed. For the city, I think it's political. I think, uh, remember, the city gets paid for everybody it locks up, so, uh, and it gets money. So if you get caught doing graph, uh, usually it's an $800 fine and community service and, and everybody kind of wins. So, if, and again, this is just my personal opinion. And I know the city will probably see this and come after me, but that's okay. It shouldn't surprise us that graffiti artists have an alter ego that may also be tagged by an alter ego name. Um, and that's because what they're doing is part of expression within the context of their subculture. And when we live in a subculture, we also live in the hegemonic culture outside at the same time, where I might be um, part of American culture, but also part of Hispanic culture or be a Hispanic American. And in my context with my family, that's part of shares that ethnicity with me. I'm one way, and I may even have a name in the context of that culture that's different, right, that I don't share with people outside. And in the context of the larger culture, I'm someone different. And it's not that I'm pretending to be somebody different. I just operate outside of my subculture in a different way because I don't share those values, beliefs, and ideas that I have in my subculture with people outside of there. Uh, uh, the reason a lot of the, the, there's, the, a lot of the writers want to remain uh, in the shadows and yet want to be famous. Um, and that's because a lot of them have warrants for their arrest, probation, uh, drug problems, uh, uh, and they don't, they don't want to be in the spotlight because there's a fear of authority, the fear of the cops beating you up because it's a history of the police brutality when it comes to graffiti, but it's, it's a known thing. It's almost like a cat and mouse game. I know that if I hit a wall and a cop catches me, I'm going to get my ass beat. 
So I go out and I take the risk for the rush, and then I run from the cop when the cop finally catches me. And then he beats my ass, and it becomes a, almost a badge. And then I go out again after, and I even hit harder. It's a, it's a really inter interesting mindset. I don't know why you know anybody wants to be known. I guess it's just van pure vanity. Um, you know, just... I just want to see my name again and again. You know, I ride by different places and just like to see it go by. Well, no, I mean, I guess, I guess, uh, I do, but at the same time, I'm trying to take my face out of it at this point because you can go on my IG and you can see me on my IG, but you know, for here, I'm I'm wearing a mask, which is kind of like. <laughs> it's kind of contradictive, but, you know, um, you'll never catch me doing it. You know what I mean? So I, being known, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be known or not. I get to create a persona, you know what I mean? And I get to be somebody else, you know what I mean? Pines is, a, is an alter ego, you know what I mean? So I get to make that, I get to make that person whatever I want. Well, I I don't think it's important for me to become famous. I would like for my graffiti to be known, not famous. I would like to to kind of show to the next generations what my generation did. You know, kind of like history, just knowledge, sharing knowledge. I'm not trying to like be a millionaire or famous, or I don't want to be like you know. I don't like that kind of things that I think that's why I'm more going through the graffiti because it's something that it's not about you it's about your art it's what is out there you know the person behind is just like a vessel you know so I don't feel like I should be famous I feel like my art should be known and like help other people to do whatever they want to do with it I, I don't do it for I do it for for everybody, I guess, you know? It's not about the money, it's more of a movement. And when I say movement, I mean literally the movement of that word and seeing if I can stretch it, you know, and get it across or get city by state in another country or in another state. And it, I think that's the motivation right there. It's not, it's not to be famous or anything to that level. See, nowadays it's kind of changed with Instagram and Facebook. It's made everybody instantly famous without having to earn anything. So people go out in their backyard and they, they do this piece and they put it on Instagram and they say, look what I did. Or you've got people who are fools where they're like doing vandalism and they're putting their face in it and posing like. As of yet, I, you know, I haven't gone the route of uh, Instagram or anything like that because I didn't want it to change the reasons why I was doing it. You know, I wanted to do it like in the most pure form, like it was done you know, 20, 10, 20 years ago, something like that, you know what I mean? I wanted to be uh, writing something and, you know, putting in the work because people are going to drive down the highway and see that, not because I think I can take a picture of it and post it on the Internet. I think that that changes the game, and that's, you know, I wanted to see what it was like without that. So there was a mystique in it because, you know, you're getting recognition, but... You, you're doing an illegal act. So you can't really come out in the lim limelight and be like, hey everyone, I'm such and such and I did this because your ass is gonna go to jail. And I know, you know, personally, people that have gone to jail for two to four years for a nonviolent crime for doing graffiti. Uh, it, it was just, it's just mind boggling. Um, and then again, it, that comes up with the question of if it was Basquiat who did it, we'd put, you know, pl uh, plastic seal it and charge people to see it. But if it's someone else on the street who's doing an even better job, then we arrest him and say, well, you know, you can't express yourself. I'm so sick of white. You like it in white? Yeah. You know, as a linguist, as an anthropological linguist studying, as I see this as 
an artifact of language and culture, it's always the case that we judge the language that we see based on the people that produce it, that speak it. And it's the reason we don't like black English. It's not that there's anything wrong with it. It's that, you know, it is illustrative of what black people speak, people that we don't like, people that are disenfranchised in our culture. It's why working class English isn't as good as standard English. It's, it is just another permutation of that. So when we talk about graffiti as being undesirable, what we're saying is those people are undesirable. The amount of people that have apologized to me on the street, you know, I paint cars and I do layout on, on muscle cars during the day. I've painted helicopters, stealth bombers. Like I have done some shit that nobody gets to do. You know, when when someone is so closed off that they, they judge you, it's because they are insecure with something that they can't do or they can't see into. And, and there's two ends of the spectrum. You might wear a pink tie and I might have a pink tattoo. It's just people painting. It's just, it's all different people. You know, you never know. When you meet a person, you never know wh who they are, what they look like, you know, what type of, what they do, you know what I mean? Uh, these cats have regular jobs, you know, just, I have a regular job, you know. Most people know me from my regular job because I'm a salesperson in a public place. There's so many different variables within graffiti and within painting and people who condemn it and people who look at it, like the, the stigma of it. If you think it's hood, like I said, if, it, if, it's, if it's the big bad dog to you, then, then fine, let it be the big bad dog. If you can't see past who you are and know who you are and allow yourself to become vulnerable, then just stay out of my way. <laughs>
And I think it doesn't just happen, it doesn't just happen with um, graffiti. It happens with any urban, um, you know, illegitimate form of art or expression. In our culture, in Western culture, we consider one of the qualities of art is that it has some permanence. So the question itself has to do with our values, right, about what art is. Um, do we feel it needs to be uh, saved for society? Well, I guess if we feel it has value beyond our generation, then we would want to record that and save it. If we feel that its use is for the emotional value of the piece right then and there in that communication, then there might be no reason to save that, um, like in performance art. So, and, and some of the, I think, the newer graffiti that's considered wall art is performative. I think it's, you know, it combines painting and stickers and, you know, maybe even movement in front of it. And it might not be meant to be saved. Okay, okay, so, so should graffiti be, be considered protected art? Wow. Um, that's an interesting concept. Uh, it is already depending on who you are. So if you're Banksy, uh, your work that you do is worth fifty thousand dollars as soon as you do it, upwards of four hundred, five hundred thousand. Uh, that's considered protected art. Um, the same with Shepard Fairley. Uh, if you're Crown and you're going around the city doing amazing hands, uh, you're just a vandal. Um, so I guess it all depends on who's determining that. It's the eye of the beholder. Uh, Personally, I think that if the hand is whack, if it's an ugly piece, it should be going over. If it's a beautiful piece, let it stay. Graffiti is impermanent. It's not meant to stay forever. That's the whole point of it. It's, you know you're, you know the buff squad's gonna come, they're gonna go over your piece, and it's gonna be gone. From an artist's point of view, as an artist, I say it's art, most of it's art. As a business owner, I say it's, it, it depends on who the, who's doing it. I don't think it would be graffiti if it was perfect, protected. It's, it's kind of, that's kind of contradicting. It doesn't make, because the whole point is, is you're not supposed to be doing it. So if it's protected, then you're supposed to be doing it. It, that doesn't make any sense. When it becomes, okay, the difference between uh, something that maybe should be saved or curated and something that should be not, it, uh, it has to do with whether it's something people want to pay for. The buff is necessary. It's necessary. You have to have things buffed out in order for people to continue that creative flow of, you know, the creative adrenaline has to flow. If it's been sitting there for a long, long ass time, then yeah, I mean, what the hell? If y'all left it there for 20 fucking years, leave it there for another 20 years, 30 years, 200 years, who cares? You know what I'm saying? Uh, but if it's something that somebody did five years ago, I don't Is somebody gonna pay for, you know, is somebody gonna uh, pay for a sewer grate that I write my name on with, uh, with a whiteout marker? Probably not right now, you know what I mean? But, you know, maybe someday if I become more relevant or something like that, if somebody's willing to pay for it, that's, I think, the difference. Is somebody willing to pay to keep that? Because everything costs money. You have to get, you have to let go of things that you've done that take a lot of time in order to create new things and evolve. I don't think that, it, I mean, the minute it's protected, then what are we doing? We're commercializing it. It's a game. That's part of the game is, you know, you get buffed. If you're not getting buffed, you're not doing nothing. You know what I mean? Uh, that's... I don't paint the street like I used to, but if you ain't hitting all over the damn place and you ain't got your name in every damn corner and every whatever, 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 you're not doing nothing. As far as rep goes, I just don't give a fuck about rep. You know what I mean? But as far as I know, and as far as what I was taught, you better have your name in every fucking nook and cranny on a phone booth back in the day on a whatever it was, the mailbox, every, right on it. It's, it's a guy I know, and I'm not going to say his name, but a friend of mine said, man, he'll ride on his mom. And he was like, you, she better move out the damn way, you know? <laughs> the idea that the art should be saved is a very Western concept, that it has to have some permanence.
Yeah. What do I think the future of graffiti is? Graffiti is the next step of modern art. It is the urban expression of modern art. Um, and it's kind of funny because I'm going to make a statement here. So back in the 60s, you had to do landscapes or portraits. If you didn't do landscapes or portraits, man, you were nobody. And this, this new group of artists came out that started doing abstract art and all this really weird stuff. And the established art community said, this is bullshit. It's not real art. Fuck you. Well, now these guys, these rebels from the 60s are in power. And what do you think they're saying about graffiti? This isn't art. This isn't real. This is bullshit. They have now become the same established monsters that they rebelled against when they were younger. It's kind of like like all the styles are like melting together, you know. People are taking styles from this city and styles from that city, and like kind of like what I do, like they make it their own. You know what I mean? So it's gonna just get harder and harder to stand out, you know. But Philly's still gonna have its own hand style, you know. Uh, I you know, again, I'm not the. I'm the hip hop guy, you know what I mean? I'm not the artist guy, you know? So the artist guy can say, you know, oh, this is gonna go here and this is gonna translate to this and this is gonna translate to this. That's not me. I'm just the, I'm the all around hip hop guy, like really for real, you know, I'll hurt somebody's feelings with a pair of turntables. You know what I mean? I'm that guy. I'm the beat banger SB1200, if you know what that the hell is, guy. You know what I mean? I'm the hip hop, you know, all around. I'm not the art. You know, I, I do graffiti because I'm vain. It's just that fucking simple. In Philadelphia, nowhere fast. Hurry up and wait. You got a lot of guys right now that are, they're dicking other creative artists. And it's, it's getting to where it was like 15 years ago where people are starting to get into fights over it. And people have a bounty or a price on their head for other people to rat people out and... I don't know. I, 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 I think it's, it's always going to be the same. It will always be the same. You know, it, it, there's always going to be guys that want their name out there the biggest, or there's guys that want to be the highest, or there's guys that want to be, you know, whatever. I think it's full, like if you flood the garden and there's no more space to put any more water, and there's a lot of water in Philadelphia right now. Yeah, I, th I just think it's harder. It's I think it's getting harder to stand out because you're seeing, and again, I think the, the internet, and you'll hear other people say this, I think the internet has changed that. You know what I mean? Now somebody can go on YouTube, look at this guy's style from Russia, and copy it. Boom. You know what I mean? Now you're some guy in Kansas writing on freight trains with this guy's style. and You know, I, so it changes things a lot. You know what I mean? So it, it, it is getting harder to stand out, you know? How many times can you possibly draw the same fucking octopus with four eyes and do this and that, you know? I think there needs to be a message in everything that people do, not just a character or, you know, like any people to interact with it, physically wear it, see it, and, and be part of it. Commercialized a lot. Like, McDonald's is using it for publicity, like, everything like hip hop in general is like growing you know it's taking the over the rest of the cultures if you turn the radio you're gonna listen hip hop and hip hop is graffiti you know hip hop is djing hip hop is other stuff but they're turning that culture into something popular so the roots are like getting away i think the art is gonna grow like the graffiti is gonna just explode to a crazy level like the art fine arts are gonna be in graffiti you know what I mean like it's graffiti like now the galleries and museums are taking graffiti as art that when they started was the worst of the art the trash of the art and now it's taking over so I think it's gonna be more more popular but yeah it's it's, it's good and bad <laughs>
all cities in America, we should we should have spots that are just graffiti spots. We kind of do in Philly. We have Graffiti Pier. Uh, we have the Reservoir, but we need a lot more spots. But even then, a lot of writers that I know personally wouldn't hit it. They would be like, oh, I only do illegal because you can't get the rush off of hitting a legal wall. Yeah, I think should be some spaces for it, but it's not going to change that they're like there's going to be illegal graffiti as well, you know? Like, it would be really nice if the, if the government kind of make the graffiti like more, kind of like they promote it a little bit more, but in certain way, if they do it trying to take the illegal graffiti away from the graffiti, it's not going to happen, you know? You, you're not going to take the, the roots out of the, the graffiti, like it's, it's just graffiti itself. You know, it's illegal, it's the roots. Like, you can give spaces, but you cannot do anything about it. It's just humans, you know? Since the beginning of the time, human tried to put the mark. It's like a dog, a dog pees everywhere because it's their scent in there. Our, we put paint because it's whatever we have right now accessible to do it, but everybody wanna leave a mark in some way. So you cannot take that away from the humans, you know? I believe Philadelphia needs its own museum of urban art. I know exactly where I want it to, the old electric company building. Uh, do you hear that city? If the city of Philadelphia hears that, the old electric building down near the river should be the museum of urban art. Um, and they should do it. It should be, you know, you should go into a room and it should have a, be a subway station with a train and everything's hit up just like the old days. And it should be a back alley, another room, and it's all hit up. And another's an abandoned, looks like an abandoned factory. And it's all hit up so that we can go through it and get an understanding of the history uh, and the advancements of graffiti, where it began, where it's going to. You know, I, I don't care. You know what I mean? I just want to paint and see my name go by, you know. I'm gonna do it till I can't do it, till I can't climb up on them train tracks, you know. I don't do the rooftops because I'm too damn old to climb up there. You know what I mean? When I get too old to climb on the train tracks, then I won't be fucking painting trains, it's just a simple. You know, but I'm gonna do it until then. Yeah, man, I, yeah, like I said, I think, some days I'm, uh, I'm not doing this because I want to, some days I'm doing it because I have to, you know. It's just like that some days, man, because it's just like, you know, like, you know, I, I don't drink. Some people crack a beer after work, you know what I mean? I throw three or four cans of rust -Oleum in a backpack and get on the subway. You know, that's just, that's just my thing, so. Like, I just want to thank a lot to my wife and my family because they support me from day, day one, you know, like. They always been there for me, and I cannot complain about my life. Like you know, I, I really, I'm a happy person, and I'm thankful for everything that have gone to, like, got to me, and I try to use it for the best. So that's all. Whether people want to or not, graffiti is here. It's not going to go away. Um, you can't get rid of it. So the best point is to guide it. Um, it helps addicts stay clean, it helps vets with post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, it encourages the arts. Um, I think that uh, as a nation we need to stop looking at it as a criminal activity and throwing people in jail and destroying their lives for an art form and we need to start having a true debate about it because one of the things that will happen and always happens, the poorer an economy, the bigger, the more graffiti, the more robbery and the more prostitution. That's just truth. Idle hands, idle minds, playground of the devil. Um, and I, I just think that we just need to um, to take it to the next level and, and, and encourage it and, and nurture it just like the 60s movement did and let it take its natural progression because in South America, the rest of the world, they're doing, I mean, this has gone beyond graffiti to, uh, to I don't even want to call it art because it, it, it transcends that. It you know, when you got a piece in the gallery, it's in Bob's house. Unless you're going to Bob's house, you don't see it. This is out there for everybody to see. So it's really expansive. And I think that may be one of the reasons in this nation they don't want graffiti is because it does make you think. It does move you. You look at it, you do feel something. The writer could have a completely different intention, but you feel something from sometimes annoyed, 
sometimes amazed, sometimes happy, sometimes sad. It's really interesting. Uh, sometimes intriguing, you just stare at it and stare at it and stare at it. Um, and it affects everybody. And it's, it's, and it's a truly interesting public self-expressionism. Uh, so that's the last thing I'd like to say. Just America chill.